Well, good afternoon. I'm Nancy Reeves, and I'm a Canadian clinical psychologist and spiritual director. I've specialized in the area of trauma, grief, and loss with adults and children for just over 31 years now. And I just wanted to present some of the, the ways I look at grief, particularly the kind of combination of grief and spirituality, because I think psychology and spirituality have many um, areas in common. They can support each other well. I, I can remember really early in my practice, I had just graduated and I hung out my shingle to do some private practice and a woman called. She said, uh, I'm 89 years old and, and I just think it's time to do some work on past losses in my life. And I said, well, I, I'm sorry, but I haven't specialized in gerontology. Uh, she said, my dear, um, I have. I'm 89. I, I'd, I'd like to see you. I was concerned because I thought, well, you know, w will she be able to change? Will she be able to learn at that age? And I guess my hesitancy got through to her because she said, look, my dear, I've been through wars. I've been through depressions. I've been through many losses, more than you can even count. And I know... I can learn, and I can grow, and I can heal. That was a wonderful contact I had with her. I saw her for six months on a weekly basis, and she did. She went and looked at all the losses that she'd had in her life and just sorted them through. At the end of that time, she said, you know, I feel so much better, so much clearer, and off she went. That's the, the first... Um, person I'd had that age and I realized that you know when they say you can't teach old dogs new tricks not true in fact sometimes it's the younger dogs who are not willing to do the work needed to allow healing and to allow growth so uh, from that early experience I've seen many people in their senior years who have said I, I really need to to come to some um, it's more peaceful feeling about experiences maybe that happened when I was a child. So I want to present today in this short time some of the models that I've developed in looking at grief and loss. I think the, the first thing I want to say is, is, is a definition. When I talk about loss, I mean any experience that restricts us. So that can be as concrete as a bereavement, as loss of function, um, as moving to a new place. It can be as nebulous, but still powerful, as the shattering of a dream or expectation. If I say, at this time in my life, I expected to be in this place, and I'm not there. That can be devastating for some people. So loss is any experience that restricts us. It's also any experience um, that is major in our lives. So I might have an experience that I basically see as welcome, as, as a good one, but any time something new comes into my life, something goes out of it. There's some letting go as there's some gaining. And I believe that if we can learn to handle loss well, then we can deal with whatever life throws at us. The grieving process is the way we do that. It's the, the way we heal. And it, um, it's holistic. We don't just um, grieve on one dimension. Many people come to me and they are aware of the physical symptoms of grief. They're not sleeping well. Their appetite has changed. Um, they're crying all the time. They're having a lot of um, physical issues. And that's a big one for sure. That's not the only one because we also have a lot of mental changes. Poor concentration difficulty making decisions, poor short-term memory. Now, if I already have some issues like that in my life for other reasons, maybe stress-related, that can make it very difficult to come to terms with the loss that I'm experiencing. Emotional, a lot of people are so aware of the emotional aspects of loss, sadness, anger, uh, despair, loneliness, sometimes peace, sometimes relief. Any emotion that comes naturally as part of grief is there to actually support us. It's to help us. If I feel angry and I'd listen to the anger, what's it saying to me? 
I'll realize some needs that I have, and I hopefully will be able to meet those needs, and the anger has done its job, and it can move off. But some people have trouble with those natural emotions that just arise. They might say, no, nope, I'm not an angry person. I don't do anger, or I won't allow myself to be sad. And if they do that, they repress it. It doesn't go away. It just goes inward and twists and turns inside us and becomes what I call an expensive emotion. Instead of a natural, normal emotion that's there to help us, it's an expensive emotion. It takes a lot of energy to experience. Anger pushed in turns into bitterness, turns into resentment. And if you've ever known anybody who's bitter, they'll deny they have an issue. And you know, oh, no, I'm, I'm past that. But every time they come close to that topic, all this poison comes out. They don't live well. They pull away from others. So I call it expensive because it takes a lot of our energy. It takes a lot of our time. It, it makes us withdraw. It doesn't allow healing. On the other hand, somebody might say, I need to be angry in order to get through this experience. And they magnify it. They make it stronger. It turns into another expensive emotion, hate, vengeance. And if you know anybody who experiences those, they are so wrapped up with them. I had one woman who for a year said to me, I, I'm very angry, I'm very vengeful. I won't go out and do anything about it, but I, I just, I, I feel like he, he should pay. For a year she felt that way. And one day she came in and she said, you know, this, this vengeance is getting really pricey. I was in the grocery store today. Somebody bumped me. I knew it was a mistake with their cart. Just not too hard, but I turned around and I screamed, I hate you and I hope you die. We get so good at those expensive emotions. You know, they take us over. Uh, sadness, whether it's pushed inward or outward, becomes despair. Despair directed into ourselves or despair about the world. So expensive emotions don't help us to heal but the normal emotions do. So I encourage people to get back to those and to learn how to experience them well. And then they do their job. We don't just have these three, though, the physical and the mental and the emotional. We also have a spiritual dimension. People say to me, well, I don't have a religion, so I guess I'm not spiritual. I say, well, we all have a spirituality. Some people have their spirituality uh, supported by, structured by a particular religion, and others don't. But I see spirituality as the way we make meaning out of the world, where our values and beliefs live. A fellow came to me, and he, he'd had a whole series of losses. His name was Joe, and he said um, quite easily how he was affected, impacted by his loss on a physical, emotional, and mental level. And then when I said, well, what about on the spiritual level? And explained to him what I meant, he said, no, I'm just a normal guy. I, I, I don't have values and beliefs. I said, well, how many banks have you robbed lately? He said, well, what do you mean? I haven't robbed any banks. I said, well, why not? You might get caught. He said, no, no, it's just not right. I said, those are values. Those are beliefs that you hold. And he was surprised, but he realized it was those values, it was those beliefs that were supporting him and keeping him from doing things that he would really regret. So the, the grieving process is holistic. The way we experience loss is holistic. And one time or another, one of these dimensions will be stronger. And at other times, it will be weaker. But by understanding that, I think it can, it can support people in, uh, in their path through loss. People say very frequently to me, well, do I have to go through the grieving process if I have a strong faith? You know, surely if I, if I have strong beliefs, then I will just be able to sail through it. Actually, if you have strong beliefs, you are going to probably feel more deeply because you won't just be concerned about yourself. You'll be concerned about others as well. Other losses will touch you, more losses than for somebody else who isn't thinking or is only thinking of themselves. The grieving process is a healing process. We see in scripture Jesus grieving frequently. He grieved when he saw others in pain. 
He grieved when he was concerned at, at um, how others were being. He grieved a lot. He was touched by the pain of others. So I see the grieving process as God-given, and it's the way that we heal. Um, there's a, a big difference, though, between healing and cure. And some people say, you know, I've been, I've been hoping for, for healing, I've been praying for, for healing, and I've, God's not listening, and nothing has changed. I still have my cancer, or my friend still has to have um, heart surgery. And I say, well, what, what would healing look like? And they say, well, that the cancer is gone, that the, the condition is just not in my life anymore, that, that an estranged relationship is back the way it used to be. I say, well, uh, that's cure. That's not healing. That's cure. And sometimes cure happens. But often cure doesn't happen. It is fine to hope for cure. It is fine to pray for cure. I just invite people to add to that praying for healing. Because healing is quite different than cure. Healing is being given what we need to live well with a situation that's in our lives. And it may be that through the healing, through, through changing our, our perceptions, changing the way we live, cure comes. It could, it could be that way. But I bet you know people who have been healed and not cured. Healing has been given the strength or the love or the, the forgiveness, the acceptance, uh, the guidance, Whatever it is that we need to live well, it's been given that, and yet still having the chronic condition or whatever in our lives. And I bet you know people who have had that experience. They, they're role models for us. We, we look at them and say, I'd like to be like that person. They're still in pain, or they still have the restriction in their lives, and yet they are loving they are, are kind, they are generous, they give to others, and they see the beauty in life. I bet, too, though, you know people who have been cured and not healed. You know, the estranged relationship, after a lot of counseling, seems to be going really well. But, hey, I'm wary, I'm suspicious, I'm never going to trust him again. And it falls apart. Everybody else looking at it says, hey, there was a cure there, what, what? Why didn't you accept it? Right? Or somebody does find their cancer goes into remission. It's been years now. But they're resentful. They're into those expensive emotions. You know, I had to go through so much chemo. You know, my hair fell out. It was terrible. And they won't let that go. So we look at them and say, you're cured. But you're definitely not healed. So to be able to see the distinction between the two of those, I think really can allow people to see where the healing might be. Um, and then, maybe, cure will happen. A woman came to a workshop of mine uh, a few years ago, and it was March, and she said, um, you know, I've, I've been praying for, for healing. My cancer is getting worse. I'm, I'm you know, they're, they're giving up on me. And I said, you know, there's a difference, and we talked about that. And she said, okay, well, I guess I haven't been looking for healing. I've only been looking for cure, but I can't think of healing in my life right now. I said, well, if you look, you'll find it, because I believe it's always offered. It's there. And God can work through other people. God can work in many different ways. If, if, if you look, you'll see it. She emailed me a few days later, and she said, I found it on the way driving home. She said, I was thinking about my daughter and that I would be talking to her about the workshop. But, you know, um, two weeks ago, I wasn't talking to her. We were estranged. And we had been ever since Christmas. It was her first Christmas in an apartment. She said, Mom, you're not, you're not feeling so well. Why don't I do the turkey? And all I said was, you know, it's kind of dry. She wasn't pleased. Uh, we got into an argument, and, and I stomped out of the house. And I said, how could you speak to your mother like that? And... We hadn't spoken since. But two weeks ago, she called me. And she said, Mom, I've been talking to Dad. And he said, you're not doing well. And, well, I love you, and I want you in my life. So please, could we, could we be friends again? 
She said, I've been so grateful for that. We've had daily phone contacts. We're going, she's coming out to visit next long weekend. That's healing, she said. It has changed the way I view my life. But I hadn't thought of it. I mean, I was grateful, but I hadn't really thought of it as healing. And now that I do, it has changed my perception. I still want cure. But the healing is very important. So the grieving process is about healing. It's about healing. And we don't just grieve for the fact of a loss. We grieve for the meanings and the implications of it. So it, my mother dies, your mother dies. We could say, oh, well, we know what, what we're experiencing because we're having the same loss. Not really. Because we may have very different meanings to this loss. I might have found out at the funeral when I talked to her doctor that if she'd only gone a year ago and done the tests he'd wanted her to have, that she might be alive today. And I'm devastated by that. I'm angry at her because I'd asked her to go and she'd said she would and she didn't. So I'm angry. And that's perfectly valid. You might be very sad feeling that your best friend has died. So we have meanings on many different levels. We have personal meanings, the interpersonal implication. What does it mean to me as a person that this loss is in my life? If I say, I, I don't think I did well, I didn't care for my mom the way I wanted to when she was dying, that's going to hurt my self-esteem. and I'm going to have a lot of issues around that, a lot of feelings around that. On the other hand, if I say, you know, if somebody had told me a year ago that, that my husband would be diagnosed with Parkinson's, I would say, I, I can't handle it. Uh, you, you, you know, I, I won't be able to cope. But I am coping. I'm proud of myself. I hate that this is in my life, but I'm proud of how I'm dealing with it. And that person, self-esteem is enhanced. So to be able to get a sense of how the person feels in the, their own self about this loss can be very important in knowing how to help them. There's also interpersonal implications. Relationships change. I can remember early on, I saw a couple who were grieving the loss of his mom, and it was really hard for both of them because they'd been very close to her. Well, the, the woman liked to have a hug when she came in and when she left. And one day she came in and she said, you know, I've been feeling really depressed for three days and all I could think of was this session where you'd give me a hug. Her husband said, um, you didn't tell me you wanted a hug. I could have given you one. She said, yes, I, I know, dear, but Nancy hugs better than you do. I call out the helping hand strikes again. Out of our compassion, our caring, our kindness, our love, we may get in the way of relationships. And it's very important that we ask people, where do you get your support? Who or what gives you that support? It may be my dog. You know, there would be many people in my life. I, as a helper, don't want to get in the way of that. If, for example, I have a friend who comes in every afternoon and, and talks with me and, and shares then as a helper, I don't want to do a lot of sharing with that person because I'm going to leave and the friend's going to come and the person's going to say, I, I'm all talked out. I had a good, good chat with Nancy and I don't need to see you. We, we need to realize that as helpers, we are part of a large support system. Now, some people realize their support system, some may not. And maybe we can help them to see. I often will have meetings where I invite a person to bring in everyone who is supportive in their life. And we just talk about who is doing what. I don't, as a helper, I don't want to get in the way of that. And I don't want to be the helping hand that strikes again. Other implications. Many people have financial implications. It costs money often to deal with a loss. And... I may feel angry about that and then feel guilty, but it's quite, it's quite natural. If I say, well, I have to 
use the money we've been saving up for a vacation to, to go out to visit my dad. Um, I have a right to not like that, to feel this is not a good thing. And yet, I'm going to do it because I love him. Other implications. Change in roles. Very often somebody will say, I'm suddenly the caregiver where I wasn't before. Um, I'm not sure how to do that. Um, or there's other roles in a family. When, when my aunt died uh, a couple of years ago, I suddenly became the matriarch of our family. Now, the matriarch is in charge of social convening. Well, I travel a lot. I, I wasn't into that. But um, I got together with my sisters, and I said, I don't want to take this role on. And we discussed it and worked it through, and um, it worked out well for everybody but without being aware of that, there's these expectations that families have. Change in status. I suddenly find myself a widow or a widower or a bereaved parent or a single parent. What does that mean to me? I will grieve that. Physical and psychological status. We don't come into a loss with a blank slate. I might be very stressed. The last couple of years might have been very hard for me. And then I'm grieving, and that grief will be very, um, very strong, much stronger than I ever would expect. So just being aware of that. Impact on time. People say, you know, it's, it, it's not good timing to have a loss at, right now. Well, it never would be. Like you wouldn't with your New Year's resolution say, oh, March, that's okay. But to be able to say, what is it about the timing that makes it so hard? That often is very supportive. I see the grieving process as like a spider web of meanings and implications. I know some people look at, at grief as a series of phases or stages or work to be done, and that, that can be valuable. To, what I find meaningful for me is to say, what is the person grieving at this moment? What implication, what meaning, and to be with them there. And they might need to go back to that strand of the spider web numerous times. They might never touch it. They might only go once. We, some implications don't become relevant for years down the road. That's the experience called an anniversary reaction where there'll be a surge of grief again. Maybe uh, the same age, uh, you reach the same age your, your parent was when she died. Um, you will go through some grieving that you couldn't have done earlier. So the grieving process can go on for a long time, but that doesn't mean it needs to be restrictive. I've had many people ask, how do I know when I'm ready to make a change after a loss? Or, I don't, I don't feel like I have any energy. I developed this model in the 80s to kind of take both of those questions and concerns and deal with them. When I talk about energy, I just mean that force that allows us to be and think and do, real basic stuff. It's finite. You know, you can't just grab more energy out of the ether. But if you look at the, the circle on the left, when a loss first impacts on us, most of our energy is taken up with the, the black grief. Uh, all the symptoms, all the implications. A small portion of energy is there for survival. You know, we can look after ourselves to some extent, although some people have even less of a slice of this pie for survival. They have to put on a respirator. They have to you know, be hospitalized because they're in such shock. As time goes on and more issues are dealt with, we get to the second circle where everything that needs to be done in our life is being done. It's still a lot of grief, though, in our lives. It's this place that I find that more people want to come for counseling or support um, because they say, I, I feel worse now than I did early on. Well, early on we have an experience called an emotional anesthetic, which kind of numbs us, keeps us from being too overwhelmed by our loss all the time. We certainly are sometimes. But now that's worn off because we're able to deal with more issues. As time goes on, if we allow the process, and it doesn't just go se sequentially, it kind of moves back and forth as new issues come up, new meanings come up, we'll get to the third circle where a little bit of life enhancement is present. Some people say, oh, great, I've, I've, I've finished grief. 
Well, you have it. That's just a glimmer of what's to come. Some people feel guilty at this point. I shouldn't feel so good. But it is a time of lightness. Somebody may look out the window for months and say, it's, it's beautiful out there and I have cancer. And, and, and now they look out and say, it's beautiful out there. And they're not automatically thinking of and feeling their loss. The, the last circle is just to show that we never do get to a point where there's closure, where nothing can touch us about this loss because we're caring, compassionate, loving people. And we will always, the important uh, losses in our lives will always touch us at some point. But they don't have to be restrictive. In fact, they can make, and this is where it really ties into spirituality, they can make life more precious because we know that someone can die or be injured. It's more precious. Relationships, life. So if somebody's wanting to make a major decision, um, major change in their lives, have another child, get uh, into a new relationship, a new job, uh, move from the family home. It takes energy. And if you're in the first, second circle, the energy for that change, not just physical energy, but emotional and spiritual and mental, will come from grief or will come from survival. And, and you won't feel you're coping well. If you wait until you've got a little bit of life enhancement energy, that gets wiped out. And people start resenting the change. You know, I thought it was going to be good to get back to work. and Well, I don't have any enjoyment anymore. Best to wait sometime between the third and fourth circle, where you have enough energy for life enhancement um, and still are able to take on this new um, part of your life. Some people reach that place in a few weeks. Some people... More often, it's, it's some months down the road. Some people, with some implications that are so difficult to deal with, it could be years. But I find if people can monitor their energy and, and um, support themselves through that, it makes it a lot easier. Some people, if, you, if they have chronic conditions, might need three-quarters of their energy going to survival. It's not just um, you know, a few things that I have to do for survival in my life. It's a lot of things. One man said, you know, it takes me till noon to have people get me dressed and, and bathed and, and fed, and then, you know, I'm ready for a nap. So in that case, we have to be very creative at how to bring life enhancement energy into um, this whole picture. So the energy model, just being aware of that. Um, as we as we kind of wind up this section, I just wanted to, to mention one other thing, and that is that to support ourselves as helpers working with people who are grieving, um, we need to have holistic self-care strategies. I really believe that unless we are touched emotionally by the people that, that we care for, we're not going to be very helpful to them. You know, we might as well be a machine. And so I talked about the four different uh, dimensions of grief. We need self-care strategies in those four. I get some helpers that come to me and say, well, I'm doing lots of things. I'm jogging and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm uh, dancing every weekend and I have bubble baths. And I say, well, so you're doing it great on the physical level. But what about the emotional? What about the mental? What about the spiritual? Or somebody else who will say, well, I do a lot of spiritual practices. Okay, do, do you use your body? Or like, when the stress is on that level, in that dimension, you have to be aware of it. So if, if we can look to see what self-care strategies would be helpful for us in each of those four levels, I think we will not burn out or develop compassion fatigue. Um, also, to help people that we work with to have self-care strategies, we'll empower them. I'm all about empowering. The grieving process is healing. The um, way we deal with loss can help us grow, can help us to live in a way that fits for us. Thank you so much for, for being here. I know that there will be some time for questions, and I think that's going to be on a different video.
So the, the material for this presentation is out of two of my books. I have eight books published. And uh, Path Through Loss, uh, which is a workbook. It's got a structured journal in the back for those who like that. It also has a lot of my models in the front. Found Through Loss has two CDs in the back, and it's stories of healing and of growth, um, all different kinds of loss, and uh, often uh, book groups uh, do those or individuals or families. <laughs>